It's time to explore wrestling's past and potential future with your weekly dose of a segment we call What If? Only found here on the WWE Podcast. Welcome back to another What If? And tonight, or this morning, depending on when you're listening, we are going to discuss what if HBK never went on a second run. What if he came back in 2002, had his match with Triple H, and then never went on beyond that, and it just stopped in 2002? Anthony DeMarco, of course, is back with us to discuss this, and uh, how you doing, man? I'm doing well, and you know what? I went back and watched this pay-per-view, SummerSlam 2002, and while it was just a phenomenally great pay-per-view, one that like you can only dream of having nowadays... Like, the other part about that pay-per-view was the fact that they fully left the door open for HBK potentially never stepping foot back in a ring. And I don't know when the decision was made that he would come back full-time, and he stuck around for, what, eight more years after that before ultimately retiring in, I believe it was 2010. But it's just crazy watching it back and realizing that they fully just left it wide open to go in either direction. It is. And I do remember watching uh, one of the documentaries, as there have been many, about that uh, that return and that match specifically. And it was, as you said, intentionally left open because... He didn't know how his body was going to respond. He, being um, uh, Shawn Michaels, did not know how his body was going to respond after being out of the ring for, what, four years at that point? So it it was an experiment and one that obviously worked extremely well. So they went the route of, well, we could say he's paralyzed and he can never have a match again and Triple H is a dastardly SOB. Or they could have said, well, uh, yeah, he's injured, but luckily his spinal cord was not severed by the uh, the sledgehammer uh, to the back and he obviously went on another eight year run so yes it was left open intentionally but what a brilliant match that was well like right off the bat and triple h played such a big role in his return to the company in 2002 and they kind of like dove headfirst into that right off the bat you know hbk wins the world heavyweight championship in the first ever elimination chamber match at survivor series 2002 Then they have the three stages of hell match, and I believe it was Armageddon 2002. And then obviously they had the crazy uh, last man standing match at the Rumble in 04. They main evented uh, WrestleMania 20 with Benoit. They did the same exact match with Benoit at at Backlash. And then their rivalry kind of culminated at, I believe it was Bad Blood 2004, Inside Hell in a Cell. So for two years on and off, these two were kind of the faces of Monday Night Raw and the biggest rival in the company. So had he not returned, how do you think it would have directly affected Triple H? Because to this point, before HBK came back, his biggest rivals were The Rock and Stone Cold Steve Austin. And as we've kind of reviewed in the past couple of shows, those two guys were fast tracking towards careers outside of the ring. Yeah, that would have been a really tough day or a tough um, run for Triple H. And I'm sure given how brilliant Triple H was, he could have, you know, he could have worked with anybody. I continue to work with Chris Benoit. I mean, he could have continued to work uh, maybe even Eddie Guerrero if he had come over. I mean, there are there are certain guys he could have continued to work with. Um, even obviously Batista that got into the mid 2000s. Um, he could have had a longer program with him. Um, you know, th- there are guys, but, um, I think that they needed one another. I mean, they had so many memorable matches that it's hard to imagine both of their careers without one another facing, uh, facing each other in my God, it felt like four years of on and on, on again, off again matches. And so with triple H directly though, he, I don't think he would have been as big now. He is so good that he probably would have continued to be a Hall of Famer. I don't think it would have stripped that title away from him. But the quality of matches that he had with with HBK and the story they are able to tell is one of the most personal, uh, just heated blood rivals of uh, really in the last 20 years, you could argue, of how good that they were together. And, you know... Well, DX wouldn't have reformed. We wouldn't have gotten the brilliance of Shawn Michaels at WrestleMania 25, and we'll get into that. But uh, yeah, Triple H directly, it would have, I think, hurt him in a big way. Uh, but he's so good, I think he would have continued to work with the other babyfaces that were available. 
but there's nothing like HBK Triple H. The chemistry that they have is uh, it, it's it's untouchable. It's because I'm looking at the Monday Night Raw landscape during this time, and I know The Rock and Steve Austin kicked around until the spring of '03, but Austin was on the shelf until February. The Rock was over on SmackDown until January, and then they had that run leading into WrestleMania 19. And aside from these two guys, you know, Raw was kind of thin back then. Like, And it's crazy to think of so- some guys that got main event pushes almost out of necessity, like Scott Steiner's flopped uh, babyface push against Triple H. Mm-hmm. You had Booker T fight uh, Triple H for the World Championship at WrestleMania 19. They tried to push Kevin Nash in that role in early to mid-2003. And then you look at how they divided the rosters up during this time, and maybe it was in part to them thinking they had more time with Austin over on Monday Night Raw or with The Rock. And obviously they got Goldberg over there following WrestleMania 19, but a lot of like the heavy hitters were over on SmackDown, like Brock Lesnar, Kurt Angle, The Undertaker, The Big Show. And... When you look at Monday Night Raw and we think back to it of this time, do you not feel like Shawn Michaels almost, I guess not single-handedly, but along with Triple H, really just helped them steer their way through the post-Rock Austin era? I think he did in a in a pretty big way. I mean, you have two stars that were household names, guys that are once in a generation stars uh, in, in pro wrestling and helped shape the company that it is today. I mean, I don't think we can ever underscore how big those two were. And so when they leave, it leaves a massive footprint or a massive, um, a massive hole, you know, a, a big gaping hole in the company and you need to fill that with something and as austin said on his way out in one of his interviews i remember he was talking about how before he retired he said yeah tomorrow's it um obviously he didn't tell anybody about the uh the wrestlemania 19 being his final match but he said you know i'm I'm just a a cog in the the machine right you just pull me out and plug somebody in well it doesn't work that easily when you're that big of a star and same with the rock so Shawn michaels certainly helped navigate the waters a bit brock lesnar coming in certainly helped Uh, i mean his run was only two years long before he went off to try uh, football in 04 but i think that yeah Shawn michaels on that baby face side uh, was so critical to at least soften the blow of 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 austin leaving monday night raw and yes he was still there as the sheriff or the co-gm or in some kind of authoritarian role which i think was really entertaining with eric bischoff but i think yes there's no question about it that on the performance day to day day in day out you know uh in the ring Shawn michaels was your top guy And maybe for a younger fan like myself, like I only knew of Shawn Michaels, but for an older fan like you, like you were accustomed to, from a main event perspective, Shawn Michaels being like this over the top heel, the the ladies man, the sexy boy, not to use a pun, but then he comes back as a baby face and maybe aside from Bill Goldberg, but again, that was a short lived run as well in 2003. There wasn't really a babyface position higher than Shawn Michaels on Monday Night Raw during 2003, 2004. Like, you had some short-lived runs, like I mentioned, with Booker T or Steiner. Obviously, Benoit had his run. But, like, for you as a fan remembering, like, HBK as the leader of D-Generation X, as the main event level heel, obviously you started watching with the famous first-ever Hell in a Cell match between, between him and Taker. Was it at all weird for you to see him come back and be positioned as a main event babyface? Well, um, you know, four years can do a lot, right? Like four years from 98 with uh, him being part of DX and the Austin era that began in Boston, all that. I mean, and then you take that, uh, you, you take that four years, you know, absence always makes the heart grow fonder. I mean, I think that's an across the board general like rule about life. I mean, look what happened with Triple H uh, leaving the company as the hottest heel in 01, coming back 8 months later in January of 2002 being the top babyface, uh, one of the top babyfaces in the company and it was just 8 months. So Leaving as the hottest heel, coming back as the hottest babyface can be done in eight months, much less four years. So with Shawn Michaels 
gone for four years. I mean, I think fans won't remember how much they hated him as much as they were thinking to themselves, man, I, I, I wish he, I wish he would come back. When is he going to come back? Is he going to come back? And it's almost a guarantee that he's coming back as a baby face and the fans would embrace him. I, I don't think there's any heel top heel that has left the company in a in whatever fashion and come back after an extended period of time and not been cheered. It's it's just about a respect. It's about remembering how great of a performer they are, what they made you feel. Even if it was hate, it, it's the emotion they were able to bring out of you, and that's what makes you love wrestling, even if it's in, in a negative way or, or in a negative um, a, a negative emotion where you want to see that person lose. So I, I it wasn't so much a stark contrast as it was seeing the guy and going – not just character wise, but you can see there was a change in him. And again, I know he found God and all that kind of stuff. I read his book about wrestling with my life. Great book, by the way. But yeah, I don't think it was a stark contrast because you kind of expected some kind of change. And I think we were all ready to see Shawn Michaels at that point. And it was a brilliant setup to get there. The one thing about Shawn Michaels that I always respected him so much for is the fact that when he came back, you could tell that it was all about him trying to do the favors and help other guys get over. And I think in a lot of ways, he legitimized Triple H in that respect, because aside from his short-lived run with the world championship, HBK never held a championship besides the tag team title upon his return to the company, other than that one run. And I believe it was only a month. It was Survivor Series to Armageddon. He dropped it right away. And he kind of legitimized Triple H as, you know, the face of maybe the ruthless aggression era, at least until the likes of Batista and Orton and Cena showed up. But another guy that I feel like HBK legitimized was Kurt Angle. When Kurt Angle went over on him at WrestleMania 21 2005, because I look to where Kurt Angle was leading up to that point. And he had had two main event level level matches at WrestleMania 19 and 20 against Lesnar and Guerrero, respectively. But both those matches he lost in the for the WWE Championship. And before that, his biggest win at a WrestleMania came against Chris Benoit in just a grudge match at WrestleMania 17. WrestleMania 18, he defeated Kane. But those were just kind of throwaway matches. What do you think HBK's return and his subsequent rivalry meant for a guy like Kurt Angle, giving him that big, finally that big victory at a WrestleMania? And do you think Kurt Angle would have been remembered as fondly had it not been for the return of HBK? Well, I don't... Again, Kurt Angle, it's hard to say that because Kurt Angle is, is such a singular talent. He's so gosh dang good in the ring, and he's... I mean, he is a wrestling purist, and we we know his gold medal achievements and everything else. But I think for the impact of Shawn Michaels when it comes to Kurt Angle's career, I remember watching Kurt Angle, and again, in one of these documentaries, because I've seen so damn many of them um, through the years, on the network, uh, it still should be there. It might even be like a Kurt Angle, it's true, it's true documentary or something. And he talked about how Shawn Michaels was his favorite of all time to work with because he actually... Felt, you know, he actually had amateur wrestling skills. He could actually, you know, he could actually bring the best out of Kurt Angle, where he kind of felt limited with other guys that weren't able to keep up with him or do the things he wanted to do. And Shawn Michaels could do that. And he gave Angle one of his best matches ever, if not arguably the best match he ever had in WWE with uh, Shawn, obviously, at WrestleMania. So I think, yes, Sean had a massive impact. Would Kurt have been a, as big of a star if Michaels didn't continue his run after 2002 and just was a one-off? I think he would have, but I don't think that WrestleMania moment would have happened for Kurt. So maybe by proxy, if he didn't have that WrestleMania moment that you go, oh, my God, perhaps we don't look at Kurt Angle the exact same way. Um, would he have still been a Hall of Famer? Absolutely. But Sean was able to bring the best out of Angle uh, in a way that no one else could, and Kurt Angle said it himself. And I think the same kind of happened with John Cena. And you could make the same case that Cena would have gone on to be just as big of a star had it, you know, Shawn Michaels or not. But I just think back to their match at WrestleMania 23, and I've covered that, you've covered that, we've covered that together about just how underrated that match and that rivalry and that main event was 
for the company kind of transitioning out of the ruthless aggression era into the PG era. But up until that point, you know, Cena had defeated JBL for the championship two years before. The following year, he retained against Triple H in Chicago, the first time we ever really saw the crowd turn on Cena. But I really don't think it was until WrestleMania 23 at Ford Field in the main event where Cena was, got like the stamp of approval going over on Shawn Michaels. And as much as I love Triple H, I don't think he was ever quite on the level of Shawn Michaels, mainly because at this point, Shawn Michaels had gotten over as that main event baby face, which I don't think Triple H ever maybe quite did. He did as a heel, but maybe not as a baby face. Do you, would you agree saying that the way that Shawn Michaels put John Cena over and like legitimized him in that match really catapulted John Cena into the next stratosphere. Yeah. Now, see, this is where my answer might change a little bit. Um, not again, not that John Cena would have eventually have been the star that he is today and it would have changed his whole life. I, I don't think that's the case because there was so much talent and he's so talented himself, but I don't know if John Cena would have gotten the stamp of approval at that moment. I think it may have taken a little bit longer had that match not happened. So it's just a matter of it probably being delayed. And, of course, when you have a world-class talent in there to work with, it certainly helps your situation, helps the match quality. But it, And everybody said Sean can work with anybody. He makes everyone look like a million bucks. I mean, he, everyone wanted to work with Sean, even when he was the total a-hole that everyone has confirmed that he was back in the late 90s. And so uh, do I think that uh, you know John Cena would have been anointed that quickly? Probably not. I mean, uh, I think Sean in this case might have actually had a big impact on the timing uh, of, of John Cena being you know, given that stamp of approval, given the torch, whatever analogy you want to use. So I think Sean is the, uh, really affected the timing, not necessarily the ultimate destination for John Cena. It's because I think back to the talent WWE had at their disposal at this point. And the only guy other than HBK that I could think of that carried that legitimacy would have been The Undertaker. But coincidentally, Undertaker at that very same pay-per-view wins the world championship for the first time in five years. And he kind of goes on arguably his most important run in the late 2000s as they kind of enter the PG era. So, I mean, if they were looking to put over a guy like John Cena, and I think by early 2007, we knew that, you know, John Cena had separated himself from Batista and Randy Orton, even though those two were right there as second and third, Cena was the guy. Like, because guys like The Rock and Stone Cold Steve Austin were not there, do you think that HBK was just like the next big thing in terms of star power and a guy that could put an up and coming star like Cena over in the way he did. Well, I mean, I don't know about up and coming. I mean, he, he yeah, was, that's true. You know, I mean, I think th that Sean was up and coming in the mid nineties and, and, and I, I get your point though. I mean, I know, I know what you're saying. Um, you know, I, John Cena or John Cena, Sean Michaels, in in that era, part part of his career, I think he knew in the late late two thousands that hey, you know things are kind of coming to an end. Um, I don't know when or how, and obviously we know when and how it happened. But in that time, I think, and really throughout his eight year run, you could argue, as you opened with, that he was in the give back part of his career, that he was basically on an eight year farewell tour, that he really just helped other talent get elevated. I mean, you, you just brought up the example. John Cena at WrestleMania, I think, was a staple in really both guys' careers. Specifically, John Cena helped him get to that next level. Kurt Angle, kind of same thing, although Kurt was a made man at that point, but it elevated both guys at the same time. Uh, you know, Triple H, you, you can't really elevate a talent like that when they're at essentially the same level, although, like you said, I think HBK is a little bit maybe a little bit a lot more um in terms of uh star power in terms of name brand value higher than triple h so i think again when you look at especially that part of his career we're getting we're talking about 07 08 09 and into the final year of his career he was in the uh, really the give back portion in overdrive of like hey you know i'm not going to do jobs just to do jobs but i'm here to elevate that new talent elevate the, the that next generation that they're trying to create new stars from and it's so crazy because as we 
go you know closer to the end of his career and obviously the last big rivalry he had was against the undertaker in their back-to-back matches one of them regarded as the best wrestling match of all time it's weird to say because maybe you could answer this but they're about the same age or mark calloway's actually a bit older is that correct i think yeah i think mark's a little older yeah and it's crazy to say but i would even argue that had it not been for those two matches and Undertaker getting two victories over Shawn Michaels, that maybe Undertaker wouldn't have become as big of a phenomenon as he did. And I'm not arguing that he wouldn't have been regarded as the best of all time or a first ballot Hall of Famer, but in the sense of putting Taker on the same level as the likes of The Rock and Stone Cold Steve Austin, Ric Flair and Shawn Michaels, because... As much as Undertaker has been a workhorse for the company and one of the best characters ever to step foot into the ring, I would argue that right up until the PG era, he always was right under the likes of Rock, Austin, Hogan, HBK. Do you think what HBK did for Undertaker meant just as much for his career as, let's say, what it meant for the other two? Oh, yeah, definitely. And and Undertaker alluded to this I, on one of the Broken Skull sessions. I don't know if it was the one more round or the first one they did uh, together on the network. And he basically said exactly what you said. You know, I don't think my career would have been as successful as it was had it not been for, for uh, HBK. And I know we're talking about only 2002 and forward, but if you're going to get into that question of Undertaker's career as a whole – then yeah, you can't you can't talk about that without really the the first Hell in a Cell that they put together, which was masterful in and of itself. That and, and and really was such a innovation at the time, and and it was important to both guys. And so I think not only did both guys put that match on the map, but as you look at at Undertaker's career as a whole, you could say, wow, remember that first Hell in a Cell he had? It was with Shawn Michaels, and then you fast forward, and they didn't have any real interaction from really 1997 bad blood all the way until i believe i believe it was in ring anyway in 2000 and is either 2007 or 2008 they were the final two in the royal rumble it was one of yep. those and i one of those years so that was it really was almost 10 years since i had any interaction and of course we all know what happened in, in uh in, in wrestlemania 25 so I think that Undertaker and, and really Shawn Michaels had such an impact on his career because he was able to bring the best out in Mark and Mark was able to bring the best out in him. And I feel like that's a running theme with Shawn, but it was, it was so important for Undertaker's career to work with a guy that is believable and, and can bring the best out and can sell his ass off for you. And they had an absolute five-star classic, of, of course, at WrestleMania 25 that will be – and it is – should be regarded as as one of the best of all time regardless of venue platform pay-per-view so yes the answer is yes and mark himself said it what you just said is that not the beauty of the brand split keeping these two guys apart for a massive payoff like eight years down the road <laughs> that that's the brilliance of it and the thing is somebody may say well it's not fair to compare you know the the likes and star power of Shawn Michaels and the Undertaker to today's roster and yeah of course those are the, again they are once in a generation performers too you had an all-star roster back at that time and and one that you may never see again but the premise the whole the, the whole structure of the brand split should be to make yourself go, oh, my God, what about if this person ever met with this person? What if, oh, my God, like you, you, fantasy matchups are what make things fun. And that's why they're shooting themselves in the foot when they can't keep their own damn rule or follow their own rules. And I've been down that road you know, yelling about that for many years about they just can't they can't follow their own rules. And the fact that they're you know, trying to find short term gains and really creating long term losses for themselves by violating their own rules. Um, I think it's kind of come come home to roost for them. I mean, particularly Roman Reigns and uh, and Drew McIntyre, you know, another topic for another day. But, um, yeah, the brand split when it's done right. This is exactly what we're talking about here. Well, I, I feel like we would be doing ourselves a disservice if we, if we didn't talk about, you know, the the relaunch of Degeneration X. And obviously it wasn't the Degeneration X that we knew in 1997 and 1998. And we kind of dug deep on that on one of our last shows. But 
do you think all in all him coming back and by extension him and triple h like restarting dx in the summer of 2006 was a good thing yeah i think it was and and I, again, I know we spoke about this a week or two, or two weeks ago, whatever it was, so I'm not going to try to repeat myself on it, but I'll say this. I do think it's a good thing, and I understand, and I, I was even kind of off-put by some of their, their antics at, you know, how old how old they, old they were, like 35, 40 years old at that time, and you're kind of going, you know, this is a little bit eye-rolling, and, and Sean was uh, very PG in it, and, and I get that. You know, he didn't want to go against his own beliefs, and at the same time, I'm thinking, well, then what are you doing here? Like, if you're not going to be DX, either be DX or don't, and he was kind of trying to be both, um, which is, it, I think, came across kind of cheesy at times, and they, they actually often acted kind of like the Miz and Morrison with their sophomore humor, which is kind of an insane uh, analogy to draw, sure. but it, 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 it worked with them because they were such big stars, but you take that content and put it in somebody else like Miz and Morrison, and it's really just unwatchable. So um, I wasn't a fan of their comedy. I was I loved when they got serious. I didn't like with them, you know, spraying, spray painting the DX logo on Vince McMahon's plane and, you know, like uh, doing all the, the sophomore crap and, and, and chasing the coach around and throwing him through a wall and all that kind of stuff and dro- dro- dropping slime on uh, – on uh, the Spirit Squad again, I told you I was there for that. Um, and you know, at the time, I mean, my God, I was 21 years old, and I was like, "Oh, this is fun, uh, getting ringside seats." But if I was analyzing that today with a podcast at 36 years old, I would have been like, "This is this is childish. Like, what what the hell are we doing here? Why why are we not just why are we not wrestling it?" And, and you know, but uh, of course, that's uh, perspective from what how many years ago that was? 15 years ago. Nonetheless, uh, I think it was a good thing because people wanted it, right? Like people wanted it so badly at, for a real reunion. They had seen them fight for a number of years from really 2002 until, you know, that time. It was really almost four years, um, I, I feel like. Wasn't it? Was it four years that they were essentially it, off and on? Pretty much because they, they kind of went their own separate ways after Bad Blood 2004, when they had the Hell in a Cell match, you know, okay. a program that is worthy of the cell, as I'm sure yes. you would echo God. that sentiment. And then in 2004, they they crossed paths, but they didn't. That's kind of like when HBK started having the programs with Kurt Angle on the side, and that's when Randy Orton turned babyface, and then that's when the whole Batista thing happened. So I would say by after two years, okay. by the okay. summer of 04, they were kind of uh, like done fighting. Just doing their own thing. Oh, that's okay. Yep, yep. So that said, though, I mean, it, the fans were always wondering. And, and I remember, I, I think I might have told you this last time, so I apologize if I do. If I'm trying really not to repeat myself. But the hint was, for me, when Shawn Michaels was facing Vince McMahon one-on-one and he uh, did the DX chop off the ladder uh, at WrestleMania, I, and all the fans went crazy when he did that because he hadn't done that since he came back. And I was thinking to myself, okay, here we go. And that did lead to, of course, uh, the reuniting of DX, and the fans were going insane. The fans demanded it. So while I'm sure Triple H and Michaels were like, hey, we, we've kind of made our own careers here. Like, why are we going backwards? The fans wanted it. And Vince was listening, and it, I think it was generally successful. Uh, I remember them sweeping the Spirit Squad in like a two-on-five or whatever match it was, which essentially buried the Spirit Squad. I remember him shoving uh the Vince McMahon's face in Big Show's ass and uh <laughs> yeah you know, like literally I mean like there's no way to fake that 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 is just oh my god um, unfortunate <laughs> yeah yeah it's, it's very unfortunate so uh, ultimately long answer short uh it was a it was a good move certainly not without its eye rolling moments especially if i went back and looked at it with my brain today i'd probably be like uh really you know like that's not that's just that's just stupid but in the in the moment we we're all we all wanted it and i think it it did it, it did reap some benefits no question so i guess there's only really kind of well there's a two-part ending to how i guess i want to like wrap it up is that the one thing is that i always did find it a bit odd that he only had that one run with the world championship that lasted a month and that was like right upon his return and i've read and i've heard and i've said this numerous times but my cousin's like the biggest hbk fan you'll ever find and apparently it was because HBK did not want to have a run with the championship. He said that that part of his career was by him. And you got to, like, 
if you actually look at it logically, like why wouldn't Vince not want to put the belt on Shawn Michaels, right? So like if he really like him not having the belt kind of adds up if he in real life did not want it. Because like I said, like going by, like the other guys who had you know challenges for that belt throughout the those years, like Steiner and Booker T, Nash, Benoit to run with the championship, they were kind of searching for that main event level babyface. So Shawn Michaels, if he was willing to do that run, would have been the perfect pick. And the second part is, do you think that it changed his legacy at all coming back? being a baby face, showing a different side of himself, obviously just being a better place personally and emotionally and mentally. So how would you kind of wrap it up based on those two fronts? Well, yeah, that's interesting that, you know, he said he didn't, and I believe that, that he didn't want the championship at the end of his career and well, at his second run. And I, I, understand that i think for a couple of reasons he probably didn't want that is number one you know, he said it's you know past the point in his career where he you know thinks he should have it but it's the the reason why is probably twofold number one he doesn't want to have to work that many dates and have the company put all that pressure on him that of what men being champion meant and does mean um and i think that he kind of wanted to take it easy on his body when he can. He didn't know how long he had. And he also probably felt that it was time to give back. I mean, I've said that at the beginning of this, he, you know, being champion, you can give back at the same time when you're champion, the focus is on you and it's telling the fans at home that you're still talking, still the top guy when, you know, you're, you're kind of past quote, past your prime, even though Sean was just brilliant for those eight years. Um, I, I think that certainly, when you look at the totality of, of, of Shawn Michaels from that time frame, what we would have missed was like, we're doing the what if. Well, what if, or what if, uh, what if HBK was not here and only did that one match? Well, I think it would have, uh, I think it still would have propelled Triple H into a dastardly heel and, and the most hated figure, uh, on Monday Night Raw because he would have been the guy that paralyzed HBK or, or permanently put him out of commission out of the, the in-ring competition. So he would have been hated even more for that. And he could have continued to harp on that. We would have missed out on one of the best wrestle WrestleMania matches of all time. We would have missed out on likely John Cena's ascension as quickly as it happened. We would have missed out on the, of course the Eddie Guerrero or uh, the, the uh, Shawn Michaels and, and Kurt Angle match, uh, the reuniting of DX. We would have missed out on the retirement of Michaels at WrestleMania 26. And what was a, a, a solid follow-up, Although Matt Stryker on commentary did not help anything. I think that was actually, I know that wasn't part of the match, but Matt Stryker on commentary made no sense uh, in not bringing Jim Ross back. It just, it was, I mean, how can you not have Jim Ross uh, there for Sean's last match? Why is it Matt Stryker? I mean, whatever. So uh, there are so many damn good moments, funny moments, as we alluded to with him kicking people in the face, walking down the hallway. Uh, I mean, just so many things that we would have missed and talent would have missed. Uh, that he gave back to the company over those eight years. You know, we didn't even talk about that he was the one to retire Ric Flair at as well. Oh, that's you see, yeah, wow, wow, he, like, see, yeah. He was just like such an integral part in so many big matches, or just like spots. Like I will forever remember when he hit Sweet Chin Music on Shelton Benjamin. Oh my god, it was like the open, yeah, it was in the signature start of the show. I mean, forever. It was a yeah, money, yeah, yeah. And then, like, even the Survivor Series matches he was a part of, like, being the, the, um, the last guy on Team Austin at the Survivor oh, Series in 2003. God, yep, with Randy Orton. And then, Actually, Batista screwed him, I think, right? Yeah, it was Batista. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. And, like, th that moment where he's, like, shaking Austin's hand and he's just like, I'm sorry. Like, I tried. Like, he – I don't know if anyone knew ring psychology as good as Shawn Michaels – like his visuals, he was always bleeding like a stuffed pig. It was in his hair. Like the way, like I, I remember, like someone would like give him like a, a catapult. He would hit the turnbuckle, and then he would turn around, and he was already covered in blood. Like you know, he he did so many amazing things. Or he was even playing that role in the Survivor Series of the original Raw versus SmackDown, where it came down to him versus Orton, JBL, and Rey Mysterio. Like. He was just like that guy. He was like a pinch hitter. When you just needed a guy for a big match to make it look good and make sense, you put HPK in there and it would all be okay. There was never a match, 
a program, a rivalry, a segment that he was involved in that didn't work. Because I just think that by the time he came back, he knew everything about the business and he knew what not to do because he had been on the other side of that coin as a problem guy in the locker room. And I think for me being a younger fan, I think it was so important for him to come back and be that babyface role and not just give, you know, a lasting image of himself as, you know, the partier, the guy who is a great in-ring worker, but an over-the-top heel, both on the screen and by all accounts off the screen as well. He comes back and, you know, his true story of overcoming whatever his personal demons were in the 90s, and it kind of shined through in his character when he came back in 2002 and on. So I think even the lasting image, and you know what, if he had never come back, he still ends up in the Hall of Fame just for how damn good he was in the 90s in the ring. And that never changed, and that was always constant. But I think just the entire aura about him, and he almost became like his own legend by like changing the way he presented himself, the fact that he was able to get over as a main event babyface and not just as a heel like he was in the 90s. So, you know, he was never one of my favorites, but when you really dive deep into what he meant to the product in the Ruthless Aggression Era, you realize that he was just so integral to WWE surviving. And like we said at the beginning of the show, I don't know how they would have made out with the departures of Rock and Austin had they not had a, the star power of HBK to kind of fall back on and soften the blow. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's really hard to imagine. And you said, you know, how we miss Ric Flair being retired against Shawn Michaels. I mean, that that is uh, that's a huge moment. And the like you you just you hit on the ring psychology. We didn't really get into that at all, and I, I'm not going to dive too deep. But the in ring psychology of Shawn Michaels is is really it's a lost art today. I think. It's a lost art, and what has made it a lost art is just the fact of uh, not being able to properly sell, and it's all just registering but not selling, and there's a big difference. And I think that when you have a a, a generation of talent that has been told that you just need to do the craziest moves and and you need to worry about just, uh, you know, getting your, your, you know, you're getting your crap in and not, you know, so much about selling. Selling is just, that's what gives you the, the emotion. That's what puts you in the ring. It makes you feel. And without the selling like Shawn Michaels could do and, and uh, his in-ring psychology of how to, how to really navigate a crowd, how to control their emotions as you, uh, mentioned with the Team Austin versus Team Bischoff Survivor Series in 04. It was it 04? I think it was. Um, was it 04? Uh, it was 03. 03, 03. The, the Team Bischoff, Team uh, Austin. And he was the final competitor. I, I mean, I remember him just l- with everything he had left, hitting Sweet Chin music. And then uh, Batista came out and, and gave him a power bomb after Austin stunned uh, Randy Orton. I mean, it was that that is such a great match. If anybody wants to see... What embodiment? What embodies Shawn Michaels? Yeah, I mean, watching yeah. him in that match as the sole survivor, well, the, the last competitor on his team, only to lose. Uh, God, that's such a good match. Um, even if even in Austin's loss, only to come back as the sheriff, of course, like two months later. Uh, so, <laughs> I mean, really, they, they do that all the time. I love it. So, I didn't care with Austin. Like they violated that. I just like it's Austin, so I didn't give a damn. But yeah, um, as <laughs> as far as uh, as far as his career goes and what we would have missed, it, it's eight years is a lot of stuff that Sean did and contributed and were, were, were parts of moments that we'll never forget. And uh, the reuniting of DX, of course, and, and, and all that kind of stuff, re- retiring of Ric Flair, um, WrestleMania moments, and just really a, a lit- litany of things. And I just can't imagine what his career would have looked like. As you said, though, certainly a Hall of Famer, even if he didn't have a part two to his career. Part one was more than enough to qualify him uh, to get into the Hall of Fame. Uh, but part two just made it absolutely legendary, not just uh, not just a Hall of Famer, but like legendary with uh, what he was able to do in eight years. Yeah, it's he was something special. And uh, I guess I'll just close it with saying this. The fact that he was able to play such an important and integral role during the ruthless aggression and early years of the PG era while never holding a championship really tells you all you need to know about how much he meant to the product. 
because for a guy to be that level of a star but never hold a singles championship in an eight-year run, save for the first two months of his return, or the first month, rather. I really think he held the world championship for a month. Yeah, I think From so Survivor Series to Armageddon, right? Yep. It was real quick. And, and so for the vast majority of eight years, he never, he never held the singles championship. Yeah, he won the tag titles with Cena and with Triple H, but... You know, tag titles are what they are, especially for main event level stars like that. Like, just the fact that he could be so important to the product and mean so much to so many different wrestlers' respective careers while never holding a championship really tells you all you need to know about how good Shawn Michaels is and was. No, I mean, yeah, well said, and, and I think... You know, of course, you guys up in Montreal would have had that moment with uh, him pretending Bret Hart was there. I mean, uh, that was fantastic. <laughs> I watched that the other day. By the way, guys, I mean, I've said that before. Go watch it. If you don't know what I'm talking about, just uh, put in YouTube like Shawn Michaels calls out Bret Hart in Montreal. It's uh, it, one of the biggest pops for nothing that you'll ever hear. <laughs> I mean, like, and again, race psychology, his yes. face, he sold it. Yeah, he did. And he, he went all in. He they just said, you know what, that night, F it. We're going to double down on this. And they didn't even hide it that night. He was in a program with Hogan, I believe, at that time, right? So, uh, God, that was great. So, yeah, well, you guys would have missed out on that. So, and, and he, I can guarantee he, he would still get booed today in Montreal because of what he did and what it was involved in in his part in 97. Um, I, I, would you confirm that if Shawn Michaels showed up in like the Bell Center, they would still boo him? Oh, a million percent. They don't forget here in Montreal. Or they do not forget here in Montreal about anything. And uh, <laughs> no, no, no. He's um, that, I Forever. remember being at Monday Night Raw, and that was just something insane. <laughs> God, uh, that's so great. But uh, well, it's been a blast, uh, of course, as always. And and uh, this is this brings me back to just the good old days of wrestling, as we all like to say. For you, it's a ruthless, ruthless aggression era. For me, it's the Attitude Era, and uh, obviously everything from there forward. We you know, there's there's ups and downs, and and I think a lot of times we look back retrospectively, we sometimes put a, like a rose colored lens on, but we forget all the bad stuff because you have an all star roster at times, and you just kind of overlook the bad. But it wasn't all good, and uh, certainly today has it has its flaws as well. But uh, yeah, Shawn Michaels, one of the best careers of all time. Uh, Austin has said that Shawn to him is the best of all time. Ric Flair has said he's the best of all time. And, uh, you know, when you take when you take guys of that caliber and, and, you know, look at their opinions and go, wow, even the the guys that we are looking to as legends are saying that their guy they look up to is as Michaels. It's like you said, everything you need to know. So uh, uh, it's been a, been a blast as always. Yeah, man, I'm really looking forward to doing this again next week. Absolutely. So, uh, well, you take care and uh, have a good night and we'll both get some sleep now. <laughs> Talk to you soon, man. All right. Yeah, you too. Bye.